Change. If there's anything those who game on the PC know, it's change. Almost every modern gaming advance has been seen on the PC first. There's a reason those who like to tinker and build and create are so driven with a passion to build the best machine possible. More than any other platform in gaming, the PC has been a vehicle for change. It's taken an extremely long time to get where we are today. And that's why GameRanks would like to take you on a journey all the way through the evolution of PC gaming hardware. To show just how far we've come, we're going to have to go back quite a ways. All the way back to 1962, the game was Space War. The platform was the PDP-1, or Digital Equipment Corporation's Program Data Processor 1. At the time, the PDP-1 was an incredibly powerful machine, and it sold for $120,000. In 2015, that would be $950,000. That's almost a million dollars you'd be spending if you wanted to play a two-player PvP Asteroids, basically. The game was actually developed as an experiment on this machine, and essentially showed that people wanted to play games on computers even when computers really weren't a thing. Obviously, $120,000 is way too much for a computer. And as we said a moment ago, that is in 1962 money. Not to mention that its primary storage medium was actually paper. In order to keep its data, holes were actually punched in paper, which were read as binary. So not only was it incredibly expensive, but just not practical. It wasn't until 1980 that computer prices came down to an even reasonable level, and the computer that accomplished it was the Sinclair ZX80, the first personal computer that was under $200. Now bear in mind that's actually $612 in today's money, meaning it wasn't that far off from buying a PlayStation 3 when that console came out. Except it was a personal computer. In 1983, Intel released a $1,000 graphics control board. Now it didn't have a fancy name, like a lot of today's graphics cards go for, but the ISBX275 was capable of displaying 8 color data at a resolution of 256 by 256, or grayscale at 512 by 512. It had 32 kilobytes of display memory, and the hardware itself could pretty much handle any zooming, scrolling, or shape drawing that was really necessary. It could also render sprites. This was very big because console games were doing all of these things already, and were kind of considered the place to go for gaming. But as we were talking about earlier, the PC is about change. The next big milestone came in the form of the Commodore 64. Originally, the Commodore 64 cost $595, which was a little bit more, but it also did quite a bit more. The Commodore 64 actually had game cartridges. It didn't take too long before games were delivered on floppy disks more than on cartridges, due to the fact that they cost less to produce. And the computing systems that began to take advantage of this started with the Amiga, now, the Amiga itself was a rather clever piece of hardware. Instead of everything being housed and dependent on the central processing unit, the Amiga had a custom chipset which had several coprocessors for audio, video, and direct memory access. Games like King's Quest and The Oregon Trail were born from this era of computing. And while that may not sound like much, especially if you see those games today, going from 1962 to 1980, from two tiny spaceships on a screen with black and white pixels, to even 8-bit color, with sprites that move around in backgrounds and graphics and things that we all see, and frankly take for granted as primitive and rudimentary, but giving them a great source of entertainment all in the same machine. And believe it or not, a lot of 3D modeling and rendering packages actually came out for the Amiga. In fact, it was used to create some of the original prototypes for the 3D animation that today is used to create all sorts of everything from gaming to movies. The machine was able to do this because of its coprocessors and its ability to access several megabytes of RAM, which at the time was 
astounding. It certainly wasn't enough to render a 3D game or anything like that, but this was a large step towards 3D gaming, which as we all know is what the PC excels at today. And then in the late 80s, the Nintendo Entertainment System came out. Before that, console gaming was actually in quite the decline, but the NES revived that. And while console gaming took the limelight for a little while, PC gaming continued to develop at a rapid pace. The same year, ATI released a card called the VGA Wonder. The VGA Wonder was a 16-bit 2D card that could have either 256 kilobytes or 512 kilobytes of VRAM. It also had a mouse port, could output to SVGA displays, and could automatically sense whether or not a monitor was attached. Now this graphics card is notable because 16-bit consoles would not catch on for a number of years. While the 16-bit Sega Genesis did launch as competition to the Nintendo Entertainment System, it didn't catch on till 1992 when Sonic the Hedgehog launched. In the meantime, people were playing games designed for cutting-edge technology on the PC. By the time 1992 did roll around, people on consoles were playing 2D platformers, while PC gamers were treating themselves to the first mainstream 3D games like Wolfenstein 3D. And we started seeing more and more 3D on computers as consoles stayed pretty steadfast on 2D for the next few years. Wolfenstein 3D's engine actually did not utilize any hardware features. Obviously, it required a pretty beefy CPU and some RAM, which Intel was pretty rapidly developing in that case, with the Pentium coming along in a short span of time. Time because it was doing all of this in software. Being developers knew that this was the route they wanted to take, hardware makers started to take note. And though a few months prior, Nvidia released their first card, the company that really made a splash and affected the industry most was 3DFX. In releasing the Voodoo 1 card in 1996, Voodoo relied on the idea your computer would handle all the 2D stuff and the 3DFX card handled all the 3D. Well, today we don't call them 3D accelerators, that's exactly what this was. Now that very same year, the game that made people realize that 3D acceleration mattered, Quake, came out and completely changed everything. Where Wolfenstein and Doom were somewhat limited, graphically speaking at least, Quake offered fully real-time 3D environments with so much detail for the time that pretty much everybody was blown away. All of the enemies were polygonal 3D models instead of pre-rendered sprites, the levels were fully 3D instead of a 2.5D illusion. The game used pre-rendered light maps, which essentially created much of the perspective. And all of this just came together to create both the most evolutionary and revolutionary game possible at the time. I remember playing Quake as shareware and thinking, what just happened? Most of 3DFX was actually bought by Nvidia when 3DFX went bankrupt in 2002, but in 1996, you could really feel their impact. A slew of 3D cards flooded the market in the coming years. As consoles began to adopt the idea that games could be 3D, more and more gamers in general wanted to play high-performance 3D titles. 3DFX continued absolutely annihilating the competition in 1998 by releasing the Voodoo 2. It improved on the original's resolution by quite a bit, allowing you to play games in 1024 by 768 which if you have a 720p HD TV that you play games on now, is actually not really that different as far as number of pixels. This card managed to stay relevant for years by combining 2D and 3D graphics capabilities, which is not exclusive to their graphics line, however the 3DFX technology was. An all-in-one graphics card that absolutely knocked the crap out of everything else that managed to stay relevant past the turn of the century. A little before then, in 1999, Nvidia also released the very first GeForce card. Now, Nvidia had been gaining ground on 3DFX for a little while. Nothing major, and they weren't going to dominate for a while. But the fact is, there was healthy competition between 
several graphics card makers that were putting 2D and 3D on the same chipset. Until, as I said a moment ago, 3DFX went bankrupt in 2002. Nvidia, knowing that they had basically not been able to beat that company in terms of technology, but was a financially stable company, grabbed up their assets as quickly as they could, and immediately began research and development, pushing forward to create some really interesting cards. CPUs at the time weren't developing that fast. Between the year 2000 and the year 2003, top-of-the-line processors were generally between 1 and 1.3 GHz. Intel was still making Pentiums, and when I say that I mean the original Pentium series. They were on number 4 by this point. But something interesting happened. AMD wanted to bring in low-cost, high-number CPUs and started dropping 2 GHz Athlon 64 processors in 2003. In 2005, the AMD Athlon 64X2 was their first dual core processor and of course Intel needed to combat that by releasing their Core 2 Duo processor in 2006. This laid the groundwork for the next decade when multiple core technology became the basis of computing. Now a CPU may not sound that important to PC gaming anymore with the GPUs becoming so massive, but the fact is a lot of stuff still even now has to be threaded through the processor. And having multiple cores means allowing instructions that need to be sent to the GPU not to get bottlenecked. A change is only as strong as its weakest link. And if your graphics card can handle multiple threads, but your CPU can't, you're going to see stuff that's limited. I mean, obviously every CPU can handle multiple threads, but sometimes oversimplifying something makes it much easier to explain. With games like Oblivion The Elder Scrolls IV, game worlds were becoming bigger and bigger and bigger. What was needed from video games was gradually becoming much more demanding. Graphics cards evolved at a continuing pace until about 2006, when Nvidia dropped the GeForce 8800 GTX card on us. It was compatible with Microsoft new at the time DirectX 10 technology, meaning people could develop for it very easily and get a whole ton of stuff out of their hardware. But on top of that, this thing was a behemoth. On board, it had 768 megabytes of DDR3 memory, and its GPU ran at 575 megahertz. Its texture fill rate was over 36 billion units per second. This version of the GeForce introduced the NVIDIA Unified Architecture, meaning its shader core was in entirely unified and dynamically allocated processing power to geometry, vertex, physics, and pixel shading operations. Meaning you didn't need a bunch of different chips for each of these different things. You just needed to go, hey graphics card, I need this. Ask and ye shall receive. The cool thing about that is needing less specialized hardware allows you to make something more powerful for less money. And though this GeForce didn't get marginally cheaper, it got marginally better. The GeForce 8800 GTX gave people the ability to do so many new things that absolutely just changed how we look at an in-game world. For instance, high dynamic range lighting and 16 times full screen anti-aliasing, soft particles, deformation shaders, on top of that motion blur and depth of field, which brought a much more cinematic look to gaming and was the next huge jump in graphics. Everyone was excited. A lot of the terms that I used when speaking about that card had never been used before. New graphics routines and libraries were happening, and they were constantly being integrated in new ways. The visual creativity of developers skyrocketed after 2006, and it was big advances in hardware such as that NVIDIA card that allowed this to happen. You wouldn't hand somebody a canvas, some paint brushes, and a palette of paint and say, here, give me virtual reality. What we achieved by 2006 is astounding, but obviously graphics didn't stop developing there. Therefore, graphic hardware did not stop developing there. And by the time 2008 rolled around, Grand Theft Auto 4 was perhaps one of the more detailed open world games to exist. In 2009, the very last card to bear the ATI name came out and it was pretty intense. And although they were putting out an amazing card, there's a reason why ATI had to sell itself. But that's all marketing and business. If we're talking about the card, the hardware itself was ridiculous. The Radeon HD 5970 was three and a half pound. And I say that first because I need you to know how loaded up with hardware this thing is. 
Now, it wasn't quite the same jump that we saw from the 90s to 2006, but speaking strictly technically, it did trounce the NVIDIA card we were talking about and full DirectX 11 support, which honestly, have a look at 10 versus 11, it's a huge jump, and that's just in the API. Between 2010 and now, graphics cards continue to develop, but what's possibly the more interesting thing is how NVIDIA and AMD are attempting to allow developers to access their hardware for development. With NVIDIA having a very proprietary tool set called Gameworks, and AMD creating a very low-level API that they claim to be open called Mantle, and both companies slinging massive amounts of mud at each other over both things, it's interesting. For instance, in 2013, when the Tomb Raider reboot came out, that was a gorgeous game. And on AMD, it ran a technology called Trace FX that gave Lara Croft very realistic hair, probably the most realistic that had ever been put in a consumer product that rendered in real time. And before NVIDIA fixed their drivers, if you tried to play Tomb Raider with Tress FX turned on on an NVIDIA card, the performance just took a dump. On the flip side, when Watch Dogs came out, it had NVIDIA's Gameworks technology deeply embedded in it. And on an NVIDIA card, it worked great, but the performance just wasn't comparable on an AMD. What's funny about the competition between NVIDIA and AMD is that they're both basically trying to define which direction everyone will go. And traditionally, NVIDIA has been who's done that, but obviously AMD wants a piece of that cake. AMD does have a lot to fight if it's going to ever get anywhere with that, though, because NVIDIA has built up a lot of goodwill over the years, not just with developers, but with consumers. The market is continuing to evolve, and gaming is continuing to demand more and more. With the Unreal 4 engine's usage picking up, games are going to require hardware with massive specs. Truly, PC gaming hardware is going to always be in flux. And that's part of what makes it so interesting. And while we could have gone on and on and on for, frankly, hours about this topic, we're pleased we were able to give you a look into the difference between then and now. Seeing how fast it developed and how far it came always makes me excited for the future. And I hope it does the same with you. Don't forget to leave us a comment, maybe tell us what you're running in your computer, and click the like button as well because it helps us immensely. If you're not subscribed, now would be a great time to do so, because we upload brand new videos every single day of the week and the best way to see them first is a subscription. As always, we thank you so much for watching this video, hope you enjoyed it a great deal, and we will see you next time here on GameRanks.